saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Today is Tuesday, October the 12th, and we gather this next hour around the gift of the inspired and true Word of God and put on our Christ goggles as we continue our study in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 25. The Lord prepares the Israelites for when they arrive in the promised land, which unfortunately was going to be quite a while still, but yet he prepared them. He talks about a whole Sabbath year, a year of jubilee, redemption, and mercy to the poor. All that he commanded them, he reminded them over and over, I am the Lord your God, and he reminds them at the end, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So this identity is what we focus on for us today. Our identity is once redeemed by the Lord. We see it in Jubilee in the Old Testament, and we see it today by the Jubilee, by the blood of Jesus. For today, the gifts are ready, ready for you. Thy Strong Word is graciously graciously underwritten by our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation. For more information on their great work around the world, visit lhfmissions.org, lhfmissions.org. Helping us to be strengthened by God's word, we welcome back to us regular guest, Pastor John Lekomsky, co-host of Wrestling with the Basics here on KFUO. Pastor Lekomsky, welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Yeah, good to be back, Brady. And and I just want to say this is our last time that we'll be talking together from the same state, (laughs) because this weekend we're heading back down to the St. Louis area. But I sure enjoyed the opportunity we had to get together and and uh, uh, sup with with one another, and and uh, hopefully we can do that again next summer when we head back up to your neck Absolutely. of the woods. So, yeah. Absolutely, that that's a good point. Yeah, that we got together twice this year, and hopefully we'll yeah. be able to continue to do that. Um, and now, you know, now I feel bad. I should have brought out a chapter on how to talk Minnesotan just to remind <laughs> you what to remember when you come back to Minnesota. So, Yeah, well, when, we, when I come back, yeah, we'll have to start with that because, you know, I'll be out of practice. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I absolutely. will have adopted my southern drawl. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, my. I'll tell you, I'll tell you this quick story is we, so my wife and I, we went to seminary in St. Louis. And then my vicarage was in Kansas. And at that time, my grandfather uh, was an hour away. He had gotten remarried and married a wonderful lady from Wamego, Kansas. And so we did our vicarage in Topeka. And so I saw grandpa quite a bit and and my step-grandmother. And uh, we we just kind of got used to it. You know, you live in that area. You kind of get used to the lingo and just becomes part of who you are. And then we move back to Minnesota. And then we went and visited friends in Kansas. This would have been about eight, nine years later. And I remember sitting there looking around and going, am I in Texas? I mean, what's going on? How come everyone has a southern drawl? You know, and going to St. Louis, you're like, what's happened? And the reality is nobody changed. I'm the one who became more Minnesota, Minnesota iced. I say it that way. Minnesotan? I don't know. <laughs> so it, it is real. And, and to you, our listeners, you know my... Um, how I sound. I, I am truly Minnesotan. No matter what I've done, the only thing I've ever changed in my lingo is I grew up saying pop, but now I say soda because so many people made fun of me on the East Coast. So that's <laughs> that's probably the only thing that you would say, is he from Minnesota or not? So anyways, but it's great to have you again on, uh, Pastor Lekomsky. Yeah. Um, anything else going on for you and, and, and for wrestling with the basics? Anything else? Yeah. Well, you know, wrestling the basic just continues. We, we, whatever's on our our mind on a Saturday morning at nine, either Matt Clark or myself. And like I said, yeah, our our time up here, which has just been glorious. But but you know, people need to know within the week you probably have a six foot of snow up here. So <laughs> that's where we're heading. Out. <laughs> that's what's coming. So, pastors, yeah. we we're here for the word of God. And uh, can you begin our time in prayer? Oh, Lord, uh, thank you for this just wonderful text. And, and you know, a, a special thank you for Brady for the guts to decide to discuss Leviticus, because at first it seemed like it's kind of an off-putting book. What does any of this have to do with us? But, of course, uh, everything in here has to do with us, because it's all about Christ. And Christ, of course, is for us. So in Jesus' name, open our eyes and our hearts by the power of the Spirit to see what wonderful things you would share with us today. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Reminder to listeners, if you have any questions about Leviticus in general or our text today, email us kfuo at kfuo.org or call 314-821-0850, 314-821-0850. Now, Pastor, Leviticus 25, I think, is one of those texts 
that I've always heard, been fascinated by it simply because it tells of things that would be so countercultural to our times, a uh, year of jubilee, um, redemption of property. Um, it reminds me a little bit of, um, I met a gal from, uh, shoot, where was she from? She's one of, from one of the communist countries that were liberated in the late eighties. And she just talked about how in her community, people who owned the land prior to the communist regime, then all of a sudden, um, owned it again. And the people who lived there for 50 years had to leave, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. And so you read that and you're like, Oh, that doesn't sound very good at all, but this is from scripture. And how does this work? How does this look? So 25 is fascinating, but also can be very confusing. So how do you want to start, start us off this morning to start us off on the right? Well, well, you, you, you don't read Lessing, right? Brady, you don't oh, yeah. read. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. A do- doctor read Lessing, I should point out. And, and, and he always contended that in Hebrew poetry, the meat is in the middle. And I wonder if we don't have that in this chapter as well. So I, I know this is going to kind of throw things out of order, but could we start by reading verse 23? Because I think it establishes kind of a, a, a basis upon which everything else that's going on in this text happens. And then we can go back and, and look at these various items. Would that be okay? Well, let's do it, yeah. So we'll read, okay. uh, reminder, we're in Leviticus 25. Correct, you're in the right chapter, right, Pastor? Yes, that's where I'm at. <laughs> right, we have had that problem in the past. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> verse 23, and here, here it comes. It, reminder to our listeners, we're reading from the English Standard Version. Leviticus 25, verse 23. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. So okay. right in the middle, there it is. What do you have? Right. So we'll get back to this land not being sold in perpetuity, because that involves with the whole uh, uh, jubilee year and, and all that. But but I thought the striking thing here is for the land is mine. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this certainly applies to us as well. We need to understand that we have absolutely no possessions in this world. We, we like to think we do. Uh, the Israelites like to think, well, this land is our land. This land is my land. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're not doing a musical, are we? I'm not supposed to break oh. out in song. Pardon me. If I was a rich man, no. Okay, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so we need to do that. We need to have the musical version of, of Thy Strong Word. But for today, oh, no. we'll, we'll stick with this. Uh, so, so, yeah, because see, they, 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 God promises this land, didn't he? We've settled in this land. Well, this land should belong to us. Uh, but the thing we're going to see emphasized over and over again in this text, no, it's not your land. It's God's land. Uh, he's allowed you to live on it, uh, but that doesn't mean you own it. And I think we need to reflect on that, that every single thing we have. So everybody that's listening to this right now, just add up all the things that you have and understand they don't belong to you, okay? Uh, mm-hmm. Now, it was interesting, Brady, because most of the commentaries I read wanted to use the word tenant that that was the position of the Israelites, that they were tenants on this land. Mm-hmm. And and I don't like that either. I don't like it because tenant implies that you have some legal uh, ownership, uh, a lease arrangement or whatever. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, where I come from, we know all about tenant farmers. And the idea is uh, you don't own the land, but you grow a crop and then you have to give a, a portion. I think it's usually like 20 percent of the crop to whoever really owns the crop. But but you need to understand that is not the picture of the scripture. So it's not like, okay, I know I don't own this stuff. I have to give a portion of it back to God, which I think is what most people think is stewardship. That Mm -hmm. I don't really, but actually I do own most of it. (laughs) But yeah, I do kind of have to recognize it's from God. So I have to give a portion, but no, no. The, The picture, and we'll get to this at the end of the text, is that we are God's slaves. That's what the Lord says. He says, you are my servants. You don't own any of it. It's not that you give me a portion back because I own it all. Okay. And I'm just Mm -hmm. letting you use it. And and the fact that we have so many wonderful blessings and so many things we can use to our enjoyment doesn't reflect on our position, but reflects that we have a really enlightened master. In fact, he's even better than a master. But again, we'll get to that at the end of the chapter. But the other interesting thing here is that you are strangers and sojourners with me, right? Mm -hmm. Which, Brady, what's crazy about that is that's the terms that the Israelites would have used of the foreigners that were living with them on this promised land of Canaan. But now God says, no, no, you're the strangers. You're the sojourners here. 
Um, by the way, I'm going to ask you because I'm not sure about this. Do you know any? Is there any? What, what's the difference between strangers and sojourners? You have any insights about that? I have no. I have no insight. I have no insight. It's just simply uh, to me what I read was just simply uh, 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 really emphasizing the point that that you are here. You when you get to the promised land, you are there at God's discretion. Like this is you are you are not the the, the like you are you are my chosen people, but you are not more special. It, this is all by grace that you receive this. That's that's what I found, but I didn't dig too deep into that. Okay, and and that yeah, I can see that. I can. In fact, I thought maybe you know that again. Hebrew likes to repeat. It, it likes to use synonyms for emphasis. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Although I think, it, I, I think kind of stranger has a sense that you don't really belong there. You're an alien. You're a foreigner. And of course, we know what sojourner is. You're not going to stay there either. You're just kind of passing through. What's really cool about those two words, though, is is Moses is taking those from the mouth of Abraham, because Abraham's been wandering around. He's in the land of the Hittites, and and his wife died, and he's just overcome with grief. Uh, and this is a real thing for me because my wife. I don't know where we're going to bury her, Brady. Um, <laughs> well, no, seriously, because I've got a I know, I, know. I have a home yeah. down there yeah. in New Athens, but that's not where her family's at. That's not where her kids will be, and that's a decision we got to figure out. But but anyway, back back to Abraham, and so Abraham's trying to find a place there in the land of the Hittites to bury his wife Sarah, and this is what he says from Genesis twenty three. It's the exact same language in the Hebrew. I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Um, and here's the other cool thing. The, the New Testament picks up this phrase, strangers and sojourners, and it uses it all over. So Ephesians 2.19 says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. Mm-hmm. Same, same language. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Peter picks up the same language and uses it in terms of a sanctification text. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. And here's the final passage, because it's the best. And you were such a smart guy to do Hebrews and then Leviticus. Did you plan that, or was that just happy I, coincidence? I, I will say that I um, I stumbled upon that blessed <laughs> reality. Yes, it was not as planned out as I wish I could admit. Yeah. <laughs> but my so. whole life, Brady, is, is that. I have things that work out just great. And I thought, nah, I didn't really plan. I liked, I wish I, no, no, it just. So here's know, Hebrews, yeah. Hebrews mm-hmm. 11. And it's talking about these people. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Same word that's used here. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And so here's the point. When you're talking about the Israelites in the promised land, you have to understand they knew that wasn't the promised land. Mm-hmm. They understood, at least the believers, the believers did. There may have been hypocrites amongst them that didn't, but the believers understood this is not the end of it because we are just strangers and sojourners here. We're not going to stay here. We're not going to remain here forever. So there's got to be a better land that God has promised us. And, and, and that's what the author of Hebrew confirms. No, no, they they understood that even in this promised land, even in the blessings God had given them here on earth, and I'm not denying that God has given me and you and all of our listeners great worldly, earthly blessings. But by God, please remember two things. One, they're not yours. They don't belong to you. It belongs to him. And number two, we're just strangers and sojourners here. There's not a thing we have that we can keep. But that's okay. Because we got a better, we got a better country that Christ has prepared for us. So anyway, I just that was such a powerful verse. I just I stumbled across that and wanted to share that with everybody. 
I'm, I'm trying to gather my thoughts a little bit here because that is a yeah. great way for us to look at everything. Um, the first thing is I chuckled a little bit when you talked about where will my wife be buried just because I've had always yeah. a lot of blessed conversations with uh, members. And uh, about half the time, it ends up being kind of this uh, kind of a funny joke. Like, well, you know, I don't know if I really want to be buried by that guy, you know, and just kind of <laughs> a reference of, of just kind of a, a joke. And it's all done in faith. And that's why I kind of that's why yeah. I kind of chuckled on that. I don't want to uh, offend anybody by making fun of uh, where we get buried. But it was just a lot of times people of faith are able to say it because they know that that hope is that that body will be raised someday. Um, exactly. And it's just a wonderful way to be able so to So it doesn't really matter, it. does it? Yeah. yeah. Right. But, you know, I'm not trying to d deny it either, but it is. And it's trickier now. If you lived in one community your whole life, um, no questions, no problems, you know, but yeah. but when, when you have other moving around and marriages and everything. But anyways, but yeah, that brings us back to that reality of we are, our identity is in Christ. So we are loved. We are called friends. Um, we're united with him, but also we live in that reality that this is not the end, that we are literally sojourners in this earth and strangers. You know, this Sunday we're going to, we're going to sing, um, I'm but a stranger here. Heaven is my home. And we live with that reality too, that, that none of this is ours. And that can be kind of degrading for some people, but overall, I think it's a great blessing because you're like, wow, look at what all he's given to me, as opposed to thinking, you know, like, oh, how come none of this is my own? Well, my goodness, mm. he has given it to us. He's borrowed. I don't know the right language to say, but it is a good reminder for us. This isn't yours. So it's all gift, as I like to say over and over. So, Pastor, I think we need to get more into the text. What are your thoughts? I think so. All right, I'm ready to go. <laughs> All right, so we are going to start at the beginning now of Leviticus 25. And here's what I want to do is <clears throat> what we're finding is a connection of, of the, the, um, the agricultural calendar and the liturgical calendar. This is one distinction that Dr. Kleinig makes is that you have the land, and I wish I wish I was a farmer. I could probably tell you more, but talk about the land and then connecting it to our lives of faith. So I'm going to start verses one through seven, and then I'm going to skip to verses 18 through 22, because it kind of brings up the first questions. OK, what are we going to do about that? And it answers them at the end of 25. So we're jumping all over the place this morning. This is going to be a lot of fun. And, so and before before ahead. you start reading, I, I, I would point out it begins. The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. And mm -hmm. what I had not realized is this is this is the conclusion of everything that God gave to Moses on the mountain. This is the last. Absolutely. This in the next chapter. These are the last words that come from Mount Sinai. So I think that's kind of interesting to think about, too. All right. I'm it ready. is. It is. OK, yeah. let's begin. The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vine. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. The Sabbath of the land shall provide for you, for yourself, for yourself and for your male and female slaves, and for your hired servant and the sojourner who lives with you, and your cattle and the wild animals that are in your land. All its yield shall be for food. Then I'm going to skip to verse 18. Therefore, you should do my statutes and keep my rules and perform them, and you will dwell in the land securely. The land will yield its fruit, and you will eat your fill and dwell in it securely. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year, if we may not sow or gather in our crop? I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year, so that it will produce a crop sufficient for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating some of the old crop, and you shall eat the old until the ninth year when its crop arrives. So, Pastor, we have the Sabbath year. We always hear of the Sabbath day. Um, remember the Sabbath day, as the commandments tell us. And now we have rest not only for us, but also for the land. What's, I mean, you, you grew up on a farm. What's, what's happening here? Well, okay, uh, and, and, and you hit it right on the head when you said it's all about faith. 
Uh, and it's all about rest, and it's all about grace, now that I come to think of it, because the whole purpose of the Sabbath day was that was the day God rested, and God says, well, yes, you can rest too. Uh, and and it, it was really wise to jump down to verse 18, because obviously the problem is you're going to say, well, okay, if I don't work, how am I going to get fed? Because it seems to me you said that, Lord, didn't you? That if a guy doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. But now you're telling me once a week I shouldn't work, and yet some. Oh, but now you're telling me that every seventh year I shouldn't work, which means actually there'll be two years, because right, you got to have a year to grow. How am I going to live? Where am I going to have food? And that, of course, is the point that that. that God provides, all right? God is what who gives you all these things. Did you think it was because you were working so hard that you had all these things? No, no. Uh, what, what, what's Luther say? God God gives bread even unto the wicked. No, it has nothing to do with your works. It has to do with God opens his hand to all living things and feeds them, right? Uh, because fatherly, divine goodness and mercy, uh, first mm. article stuff, not because of any merit or worthiness on my part. So, so you've actually got it built into the system weekly and now annually that 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 God is the one who provides it's not the result of your works but as you said Brady it's all about grace that's what it's all about but that's going to be a tough thing isn't it Brady wouldn't you say I'm glad I'm not a farmer to say oh I'm not going to put any crops out this year because that's what God said I don't but of course it won't be a problem will it because that six year you will have such an abundance of crops that you realize oh Okay, yeah, I guess I really don't need to plant uh, this this coming year. Yeah. And it comes back to when they receive the manna in the wilderness. You know, oh, collect yeah. more on yeah. the sixth day, so the seventh day you will not have to collect it. It's, it's, a, it's a reality of faith. And I love how, like you said, those verses are included in verse 20 because he's kind of like, okay, I know what they're going to say. This is what they're going to say. So here's how I'm going to answer them, you know. <laughs> what about this? We're, we're not going to have enough food and all this. And he, he definitely shows, I'm going to provide for you. And that's a tough thing for us in faith. So that's my question for you, Pastor. As we read this, there's a lot in us that will say, well, oh, I don't know about this. Why is it such a struggle when God tells us, be still and know that I am God, basically? So so what we have here then, if we're looking at it from that pers- perspective of how we respond to it, it is the law. Uh, you know, I got to I got to preach the last couple of weeks at Kilkenny, Kilkenny, Minnesota. Yeah. And it was so good that they used TLH. It was good to have the old blue hymn book. Uh, and of course, we still have that language about the fact we're poor, miserable sinners. Uh, mm-hmm. But it, it, I, whenever I read that, I, I reflect. I don't know if I really believe that. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not perfect, but but yeah. See, that's it. We are. We re- we don't really trust God. We don't trust Him. And you know what's ironic is He can shower you with blessings, and you still don't trust Him. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that that's what it's all about. It's all, just to remind us that we're sinners, and then to remind us again, like I said, that beautiful text from Luther in the Lord's Prayer, where it says. Pray thy daily bread. Why? Because God's going to provide it, even if you don't deserve it. He's still going to give mm-hmm. it to you. Isn't that remarkable? But that's just the kind of God we have. So, so looking at this, and I want, I want your thoughts on this. I, I did not have an opportunity to call my uncles who are, uh, well, I guess they're kind of retired farmers. You know how that goes. Yeah. Kind of like pastors. You never really retire. But no, no. I remember that there were times where they didn't necessarily put a crop on certain parts of the land. And I was reading a little bit in the commentary and a few other places that talked about this actually would have been something to help restore the pr- pr- uh, the productive qualities of the land. Um, uh, because if you keep growing, then sometimes it just stops and it needs to be replenished, which obviously points us to our own Sabbath, that if we spent a day not doing anything, our bodies would be restored um, in, in, a, in, a, in a many in, in a certain sense. And so that, there's a, a portion of this, too, that this might be actually good for the land. Any thoughts on that? Oh, Brady, man, great insight, especially the personal insight. See, we you know what the heart of our sinfulness is that we don't believe in grace. That's the heart of our sinfulness, that somewhere deep down inside of us, we do think it is about us and our works. And it is so hard for God to pound in our heads that the crucial, important, everlasting things in life are totally by the love he has for us in Jesus Christ. Okay, Uh, and and there you have it. So we're thinking, oh, this is a bad thing to let the lie land fallow. Oh, my God, how are we going to be taken care of? Or especially, oh, how can I don't have time to go to church? I've got so many things I need to do. And the Lord is just he's just probably 
probably shaking his head because, no, it's actually the best thing for us to have that rest, to be nourished by his word. And the same thing for the land, to, to have that chance of rest. And it'll just make it better. Uh, it's not going to make it worse. That's what we think. It'll make it worse. But no, no, it just makes it oh so better. But it's so hard for us to trust him when he says things like this. And, and it occurred to me, Brady, I, I had painted a picture where on the sixth year you'd have this great abundant harvest. And then say, mm-hmm. oh, that's okay. We, But I'm thinking maybe not. Maybe on the sixth year, maybe the harvest is is not really good. And you're thinking, oh, my goodness, then we have to, don't we have to plant? Because God does that to us all the time, doesn't he? He puts us in situations where we think, well, we've got to do something. And, and, and what he's really saying is what he says to Adam, who's, who's named all the animals, and he hasn't found a helper fit for him. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? And, and God says, why don't you take a nap? <laughs> mm-hmm. Go to sleep, Adam. Maybe things will be better when you wake up in the morning. And, of course, they are. Of course, they are. Because, again, he is a good father. We're not always good sons and daughters, but he's always a good father. And he reminds him in verse 6 that, that, that this Sabbath year, well, first of all, the, the big thing was that it, the, the crop would not go to in a commercial sense. So this wouldn't be yeah. sent to the, you know, to the, the local granary. It wouldn't be sent, you know, all those kind of things. So it was, but then he went through the list of who it would feed. And he doesn't say it might fulfill your needs. He basically says it will. Your male and female slaves, your hired servants, basically your family. And then it goes down to not only that year, but it would be for three years that you will yeah. be provided for. Like you said, it might not have been a huge harvest. We think, oh, it'd be so much that you couldn't even handle it. It might, it's going to be enough though. It's not going to, it doesn't say I'll give you three times the amount. He just says it will be enough for three years. And then by the ninth year, you're still going to be eating and you don't even know um, how that's going to happen necessarily, but you'll know that it was from the Lord, which like you said, I don't want to go through that though. Like I want to know, when this is going to happen, but he doesn't tell us exactly how it happens, but he does promise that he will provide. Pastor, we have about 30 seconds left before our break. Any any last thoughts on the Sabbath year? Well, see, I'm thinking here's the problem. If it was a bumper crop, then we're going to feel like the rich man, aren't we? We're going to say we're going to need to build bigger barns so we can store all this up. And And as you pointed out from the beginning, this is an exercise in faith. That's what it's all about, mm. trusting that the Lord will provide. And thank you for also, because I, I didn't quite understand these verses, uh, but then I finally figured it out. You're right. What he's essentially saying is there'll be stuff that will still grow, whether you harvest or whether you plant or not. But that stuff mm-hmm. doesn't belong to you. You can use it. But then again, everybody else has free access to that stuff, too, which is a reminder that in God's eyes, we're all equal. Now, sometimes maybe you're the owner and you're the farmer and sometimes you've got slaves and you've got hired men. But for this one year, no, no, everybody's going to deal with everything on the same basis. Uh, yeah. And even the wild animals will be yeah. able to be fed by you. <laughs> Anyways, we'll get more to this on the other side of our break. We are studying Leviticus chapter 25 with Pastor John Lekomsky, and we'll be right back. How do you create a great workplace culture? Creativity is one of the many ways to accomplish this goal. Lutheran Church Extension Fund is excited to present our fall series, Creativity for a Dynamic Workplace, on November 4th and 11th. Join Stephen Robinson, former Executive Vice President of Chick-fil-A, Inc., and Mike Abershoff, former Navy Captain and author of the best-selling book, It's Your Ship, who will share perspectives on dynamic workplaces and facilitating a creative space for work communities. Visit lcef.org slash webinars to sign up today. Spanish-speaking Lutherans bring the gospel to their family, friends, and neighbors. This September 15th through October 15th, the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate celebrates National Hispanic Heritage Month. Visit lcms.org and learn about historical people and modern evangelists who bring the good news to 460 million people who speak Spanish as their native language. Los luteranos hispanos parlantes comparten las buenas nuevas con sus familiares, amigos y vecinos. Entre el 15 de septiembre y el 15 de octubre, 
las congregaciones de la Iglesia Luterana, Sino de Missouri, celebran el Mes Nacional de la Herencia Hispana. Visite nuestro sitio web, lcms.org, y aprenda sobre los primeros misioneros que sembraron las buenas nuevas en español y los evangelistas modernos que llevan el Evangelio a los 460 millones de personas que hablan español como lengua materna. And welcome back. We are studying Leviticus chapter 25 with Pastor John Lekomsky. And as you're looking at chapter uh, 25, Pastor, one thing that is interesting to me is that they're not even in the promised land. They're not no. at the Jordan River no. even. They're at Mount Sinai. So it kind of yeah. reminds me of like when the kids were little and you come to the grocery store and you remind them right before they go in, listen, we are not buying candy. <laughs> We're going in, we're buying this, and we're walking back out. So he's definitely treating them as his beloved little children, but giving them the laws that they need. What are your thoughts before I move on? Well, I'll leave that stand as it is, and I'll ask you, how often did you get away with that? Because the right, candy's didn't... right there at the checkout. Right there at the checkout. You can't avoid it. Um, right. and, 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 no, no, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say well, that just, it is it is interesting for me to think about is how was this fulfilled in the history of Israel and for God's people? You know, because historically, as far as I can tell, and I'd be intrigued to hear your thoughts, I don't really see this later on. I don't hear Isaiah saying, and that year of Jubilee happened this date or in Amos or something. So I'm kind of wondering how much this ever really happened once they arrived, because once they got there, they started having kings and the temple and everything else. They had so much other stuff to worry about. I don't know if any of those things actually ever happened. What any I, any insight on that? Yeah, yeah, and and and, and uh, I tell you what, I'll, I'll, let's save that until you talk about the verses about the jubilee, because I agree with you exactly. I don't. I, I think there there probably were some times when the the uh, Sabbath year was was celebrated, but probably not. Well, I, actually, they were out, well, we get to that. There was one time when they actually did do the 50 year jubilee thing. Uh, oh, but, okay. but I, okay. but see, you got me, th I went, you, you just are so, you got me thinking when you talked about the wild animals. Because I, right. I did not ever draw this comparison, but don't you, don't you think this is what Jesus was getting at when he says, you know, you don't need to be concerned about, about life, about what you eat, what you drink. God takes mm. care of that, doesn't he? For, for, for the, for the, for the birds, for the lilies, for the wild animals. Uh, and, and so that's the point of the seventh year that, that you realize that God takes care of everybody. He feeds everybody. Now, because we're, we're sinful, lazy people, then we immediately think, well, then I guess I don't need to do anything. <laughs> I'll just sit right. back and let God. No, 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 no. You are the slaves of God. You have work to do. So get off your rear end and do it. But please understand, you don't have to do that to get fed. No, no, you get fed. And now, see, that's the thing, too. You tell your kids, don't, we're not getting any candy. But you did make sure they were fed, didn't you? Absolutely. You did buy yeah. food for them, even though they didn't work for it. They probably didn't deserve it all the time either. But that that's the point. Okay, so thank you for bringing up the wild animals. Because, yeah, Jesus says, you're right. He, he feeds everybody. But, no, that's not an excuse to be lazy. Because there's things, you need. if you know who you are, then there's things to do. All right, are you ready to get back to the year of Jubilee? Let's do it in verses All 8 right. through 17. Let's uh, hear, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 8. You shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year. And proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap, where grows of itself nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines. For it is a jubilee. It shall be a holy to you. It should be holy to you. You may eat the produce of the field. In the year of jubilee, each of you shall return to his property. And if you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. You shall pay your neighbor according to the number of years after the Jubilee, and he shall sell it to you according to the number of years for crops. 
If the years are many, you shall increase the price. And if the years are few, you shall reduce the price for as a number of the crops that he is selling to you. You shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. So now we have some unique math, I'll say. And uh, all of a sudden you got 49 years. And then on the day of atonement of all days proclaims a year of jubilee. What would you find on this? Okay, so uh, apparently that Sabbath year, that seventh year, there must have been some of that going on. I I, I did read that, that that there's some evidence that when they were under the control of, of Rome, that, that Rome actually recognized that, and, and every seventh year Rome would set aside taxes. They didn't have to pay taxes. Now, I don't know the truth of that or not, but I, I did stumble across that as I was reading. But in terms of the Jubilee year, you're, you're right. Uh, the only evidence we have that they ever celebrated that was during the time of Zedekiah. Uh, it talks about it there in Jeremiah, and uh, in uh, Chronicles it talks about it. Um, and, and they were being besieged by Babylon, and, and then they did. Uh, then they did uh, uh, celebrate the year of Jubilee, and they, they, they freed all their slaves and everything. Uh, unfortunately, as soon as the um, uh, siege ended, then they went and they took them all back again. <laughs> mm, <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. and so here's what Jeremiah 34 says. Thus, therefore, says the Lord, you have not obeyed me by proclaiming liberty. And, and we'll get to that in a second, because that's, that's, that's a technical term. All right. Uh, see, we, we hear the word liberty and we're thinking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But but they probably would have been better off if they hadn't translated it, if they had just transliterated the Hebrew. Because it's a technical term. It's not about liberty in general, but it's about the specific practice of the year of Jubilee. So anyway, he said, you have, you have not obeyed me by proclaiming liberty. So you didn't blow the trumpet like you were supposed to everyone to his brother and to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim to you liberty. I'm going to give you a freedom to the sword, to pestilence, and to famine, declares the Lord. I will make you a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. So precisely because the Israelites did not keep this this liberty of the uh, Jubilee, this is why ultimately they're taken off into exile into Babylon. But but you're right. Isn't that a sad thing? Uh, and that's why I was asking. You, you tell your kids not to get candy, but I'll bet more often than not they, they, they still want the candy, don't they? <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And so did I. Yeah. Let's be honest. I wanted it as well. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the problem here. You're right. God's laying all this out for them even before they go in, but they're not going to do it. Isn't that a sad thing? Uh, and and just like you, 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 it's not that you're against candy. We're all pro candy, but you know that's probably not the best thing for your kids, though. Yeah. yeah. And so we look at this too, and it clearly points us to Christ. And I love how you oh, brought that yeah, up because yeah. you look at Isaiah 61, and it says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Uh, the Lord has anointed me to proclaim liberty to the captives. 61:1, and then that's then that's proclaimed by Jesus in Luke chapter four to remind us that this year of Jubilee did not work very well, but there will be the one where this liberty will actually happen on account of him. Um, And so that's definitely something as we see that the foreshadowing is not just we did a sacrifice and then therefore Jesus would be sacrificed, but also this you're not going to follow, but guess what? The one will follow it and the liberty will happen on account of him. And, and, and Brady, I tell you what, it's not the Holy Spirit, a, a great, great guy, uh, because, <laughs> the, well, no, see, that's the thing. That's why you got to realize this word liberty here. This is a technical, specific term. It's never used anywhere else in the Bible in terms of just freedom in general. And, and, and you're absolutely right. So then you go to the New Testament or you go to the Isaiah and he's talking about this liberty, this, this jubilee, this 50 year thing. And then, yeah, Jesus comes up and he says, guess what, God? He reads Isaiah 61 and says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Man, Mm. perfect, Mm -hmm. perfect access. Yeah, yeah. He is. He is our jubilee. Yeah. And here's the other thing, as long as we're talking about Jesus in that respect. Do you see the point? God knew you were going to mess up. 50 years, things are not going to be the way they should be. 
but at the end of 50 years, we're going to reset it. Everything's going to go back to the way it ought to be. Because mm-hmm. you're going to cheat each other. You're going to, some people are going to get poor and you're going to take their property from them. And, and it won't be the way that I divided it up at the beginning. But every 50 years, we're going to go back and put it back to the way I designed it to be. And of course, in Christ, he's going to put it back that way eternally. Because, uh, um, again, it just occurred to me, none of this is the way it's supposed to be. They were supposed to be in paradise. Uh, Adam and Eve got kicked out of paradise. That's why they're wandering. That's why they have to go to the promised land. So, no, this isn't the way it's supposed to be, even in the promised land. There's got to be something better, something more permanent, the, the better country, as the author of Hebrews said. Well, let's continue to move forward because it gets even more interesting. So we had the Sabbath year, we got the year of Jubilee, and now Redemption of Property is the title that's given. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read 23 again, but I'll go through verse 34. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption of the land. If your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. If a man has no one to redeem it, and then he himself becomes prosperous and finds sufficient means to redeem it, let him calculate the years since he sold it and pay back the balance to the man to whom he sold it, and then return to his property. But if he has not sufficient means to recover it, then what he sold shall remain in the hand of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. In the Jubilee it shall be released, and it shall return to his property. If a man sells a dwelling house in the walled city, he may redeem it within a year of its sale. For a full year he shall have the right of redemption. If it is not redeemed within a full year, then the house in the walled city shall belong in perpetuity to the buyer. Throughout his generations it shall not be released in the Jubilee. But the house of the villages that have no wall around them shall be classified with the fields of the land. They may be redeemed, and they shall be released to the Jubilee. As for the cities of the Levites, the Levites may redeem at any time the houses and the cities they possess. And if and if one of the Levites exercises his right of redemption, then the house will be sold in the city they possess shall be released in the Jubilee. For the houses and the cities of the Levites are their possession among the people of Israel. But the fields of pasture land, land belonging to their cities may not be sold, for that is their possession forever. All right, there's there's a, a lot there. There's a few asterisks in this one, you know. So, like, if your house is in the walled city, then you have to redeem it within a year. But more or less, it gives you uh, the reality that this will go back to the original owners. So it's an interesting um, dynamic of, I would say, grace and mercy and a little bit of confusion for a 21st century American. How would you pull this all together, Pastor? Okay, actually, let me begin by saying I'm glad you repeated the verse we start with because there was a little phrase in there that we probably need to make note of real quickly. Uh, God said, for you are strangers and sojourners. We talked about that. But he says you're strangers and sojourners with me, with Mm. me. And I, mm-hmm. I puzzled over that, Brady. I don't know if you have any, because I'm thinking, what is God saying? Is God saying, okay, you're strangers and sojourners, but I'll always be with you, with me, and that could be. But then I thought, or is he saying that I'm a stranger and sojourner too? And if so, then he's definitely mm-hmm. talking about Jesus, isn't he? Who was a stranger and a sojourner on this earth. Well, it, well, anyway, we'll let people wrestle with that. But I did think it was interesting. He didn't say, you're a stranger and sojourner. He says, you're a stranger and sojourner with me. So whatever's going on here, you ain't going to be doing it alone, okay? Your Lord's right. going to be with right. you. But but now, so here's what's really cool in this. So the question is, God God divides up the property, right? That's how it starts off at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Everybody has their place. Everybody has a plot of land. Uh, that's how it's given at the beginning. Uh, of course, as we said, this is going to get all messed up. And the idea of the Jubilee is it gets reset. Everybody gets back to where God gave them originally. But how can we do that? How is that process? How do you get it back? And so God says, well, there, the, the way of doing this is called redemption. Uh, and this is one of the books in the Bible where redemption is really, really prominent. And, and the nuance of the word redemption um, is that it's something that is done by a family member. OK, uh, mm-hmm. it's not just that you you buy something back. That's how we use the word redemption. Right. You redeem a coupon or something. Uh, but the Hebrew word redemption 
means a family member. It's got to be somebody with a connection to you. Uh, and this goes back to what you talked about earlier, that we are connected. He's our Lord, our God. What, what's he say in Isaiah 43? Uh, Thus says the Lord who, who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And we need to understand that. That's what the year of Jubilee was. If if you didn't get it redeemed by, by your brother or your family or your kinsman, then God would redeem it for you after 50 years. But you always have that possibility of a redemption happening before the 50 years. Uh, and it, it comes from one of your family. And, of course, now this is all about Jesus, right? Because what does Jesus say to his disciples? He says, go tell the disciples. Uh, don't tell my brothers, he says. He doesn't say, go tell my disciples. Go tell my brothers that uh, my God is your God. He says, my father is your father. So that, if, if you're wondering how this is all going to get reset at the end, especially for those of you who've lost a lot of things, who don't have the, the property that you started out with, uh, somehow that's been taken away from you. Here's how you can know, because you've got a kinsman who's going to, re- in fact, he has redeemed us, hasn't he, Brady? He's already paid the price. So you can be sure whatever you've lost in this world. And what did Jesus say? You're going to get it back a hundredfold. So don't, mm. well, we mourn. We mourn our losses. I'm not saying we shouldn't mourn our losses, but just remember we have a Redeemer, uh, and he's going to set everything right uh, when the time comes. Well, and he definitely is setting this up where it, it is hard for us to totally understand what yeah. what's happening, but he, because he, he gives really the, the year of Jubilee was two years of Sabbath rest from um, receiving the crop or selling the crop or whatever it might be. So it's 49th year. And then the 50th year was that. And everything gets restored. So we read this, and in a capitalistic society, we're kind of like, well, you got to work for this. you got to own property in order to gain money. You need to have this and you need to have that. And he takes all of that away. I mean, this goes back to, uh, you know, a mighty fortress is our God. You know, take all these things. I still have a mighty fortress. And yeah, he's definitely he laying the groundwork for that, not only of <laughs> that, that he will provide, but also he shows the redemption piece, which we will kind of say, you know, my redeemer, uh, kinsman redeemer. We understand that language, but here we fully see it, that God will provide the kinsman redeemer in order for people to be going back to their property. And for us, obviously, that we find that in Christ that will bring it all back. And they say, bless us a hundredfold um, on account of Jesus. So it, it really is confusing. I don't want to get lost in the weeds, but it definitely calls us to faith as you read what the Lord was preparing them for. Any last thoughts? Well, and I, I think the thing, too, is is that uh, we, we tend to associate Christianity with different economic systems, and, and that's because communism tends to be atheistic and therefore, well, capitalism. But, but you know, as Christians, we don't care. Be a communist, be a socialist, be a capitalist. We, we don't care. Be, be a dictator, be a democracy. There are certainly things that are advantages of being in a democracy. I'm not denying that. But, you know, the Christian church has existed in all of those environments and has prospered in all of those environments because the Christian church is so much bigger and, and more fundamental than any of those things. And we recognize that in all of those systems, you got sinners, and therefore they're all going to mess up. They're all going to mess up because of what you're working with. <laughs> if you had a bunch of saints, uh, any system would work, right? Uh, but right. but no, uh, but but no. Here's the key thing: we know we've been redeemed. Uh, and now and we get to the next verses. So what does that mean? How do we live our lives as people who? have been given everything. It's all by grace, like you said. And, and and we know that even what we've lost will be given back to us because we have a kinsman redeemer who's going to return all that property to us. So what does that mean for our life now here uh, amongst the people who are also sojourners and foreigners? So let's keep reading on because it, it transfers kind, kind of like, okay, this is how this works, to once again a mercy towards the poor. And that's yeah. a common theme throughout the scriptures as well. Like you're saying, whatever financial uh, way you do things or whatever society you have, our call is still to serve our neighbor, especially the poor. We see that throughout the Bible. So let's read 35 and, through 40. Can I say one quick thing before we mm-hmm. say this? See, it Please. all goes back to the fact that the land isn't ours. 
Yeah, so if right. you think your possessions belong to you, then of course you're going to hold on to them tight, right? They're my possessions. Mm-hmm. But when you understand they don't belong to you, and you understand you're not going to be able to keep them, keep them. If you're building big barns to to, to st- store everything up, trust me, buddy, your soul may be denied, have <laughs> required of you tonight. So, so if that understanding, and then under the standing of, of a God of love and mercy, well, of course, how could you not care for the poor? You know, how could you hold back from them? Yeah, yeah. Let's continue on. Verses 35 through 46. If your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and a sojourner and shall live with you. Same Take language no we had before. See, stranger Absolutely. and sojourner. Yeah, okay. And, yep, exactly. Take no interest from him or profit, but fear your God that your brother may live beside you. You shall not lend him your money at interest, nor give him your food for profit. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. If your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired servant and as a sojourner. He shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. Then he shall go out from you, he and his children with him, and go back to his own clan and return to the possession of his fathers. For they are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall rule over him ruthlessly, but shall fear your God. As for your male and female servants whom you have, you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are around you. You may also buy from among the strangers who sojourn with you and their clans that are with you, who have been born in your land, and they may be your property. You may bequeath them to your sons, and after you inherit as a possession forever, you may make slaves of them, but over the brothers, the people of Israel, you shall not rule one over another ruthlessly. Now, Pastor, I want to do this. I look at the the rest of our time, redeeming a poor man, kindness to poor brothers. We have a very similar language here. So I wanted to focus on this. We might not get to the very end, but I want to make sure we're on the same page. When it talks about kindness to the poor brothers, um, supporting uh, the poor brother, the no interest from this, how do we look at this in context of then and also today? So I want to make sure we're on the same page as we look, because we already talked about redemption. I want to make sure we're on the same page in these verses. So where would you start? All right. So, so again, I, I, it's a very clear exhortation that, that when we see people, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. That this is how Christians operate. Uh, Christ deals with us in grace. But we, we don't look at people and say, oh, they deserve this or they don't deserve it. When we see someone in need, we're, we're, we, we take care of them. That, that's what we do. Uh, and again, I understand, I understand that can be abused. <laughs> And, and so, I mean, on the flip side, we have the business. If you're not going to work, you shouldn't eat. But, but no, that that's not our concern here. Our concern here is we would take care. You know what's really bothers me about this though is apparently you could you could purchase slaves uh, from outsiders, you know, right. from the foreigners, and that that makes me feel a little uncomfortable. But then I remember what what Paul says to to Philemon about his slave Onesimus, and he says, you know. He's your brother now. See, that's that's why you got to understand this is Old Testament stuff. You do not want to stop here. This is not a good place to stop. Okay, mm. it's a good place to begin, but you don't want to stop here because in the New Testament we understand that God intends all these people to be our brothers, and therefore, how could you possibly treat anyone as a slave? You can't do it here in the Old Testament either if they're your brother. The thing we understand though is that our brotherhood isn't based upon our nationality. Our brotherhood is based upon uh, our Savior Jesus Christ, who declares that He loves the whole world. See, okay, so this is the the new thing that we have that they didn't have back in the Old Testament. Um, mm-hmm. So, 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 yeah, I, I don't know what else to say, uh, except that I, I would point out that the English doesn't do us a service here when, when it uses the word servant and the word slave in the English translation, because in the Hebrew, it's all slave. Uh, mm-hmm. We have slaves. We're God's slaves. That's why maybe we should have extra respect for slaves because we were slaves, you know. Uh, uh, and, and I keep thinking of the passage where Jesus says we love because he has first loved us. And I think that's the, why this comes at the end of this chapter. We've, we've established what God has given us. And now, how could you not? How could you not show kindness uh, to the poor people that are around you? Yeah. 
And this is why when you look at verses 35 to 38, you have this reality of um, you have family who ha- who get into tough times. We all have this, you know, whether it was us or someone within our family or someone within our church, whatever it might be. And he's very clear. It's time for you to step up, like you said, to feed the poor and to to uh, to the good Samaritan and so forth. When it talks about not taking interest, you know, we can leave all that, to, you know, usury and how do we look at this? But the the per, the point here is to be gracious upon your brother and brothers and sisters in Christ, because you know you just charge an interest just because because you don't really need it, but you do it because that's supposedly a rule. Um, no, you do this for the sake of mercy for others, and then he lays it all back, which I think is another foundational verse of everything we have here in thirty eight. I am the Lord your God. He establishes that. He doesn't stop there, though. The beauty of this. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. Remind that he's not a God who's just laying down the laws. He's like, I saved you. I'm I'm with you. Like you said, I'm a sojourner. You're with me in this whole process, and I'm going to be your God. Remind he's not a God who walks by and doesn't just bring the law, but he's one that brings freedom to the captives and proclaims liberty to his people. Pastor, we have about a minute left. How would you bring all this together in Leviticus 25? Well, Brady, you actually did it. You actually did it because how does, <laughs> well, no, how do the words begin in Mount Sinai? How do the words begin in Mount Sinai? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. How does this chapter conclude? They are my slaves whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So, so you're absolutely right. I'm the guy who gave you freedom. I'm the guy who's given you the promised land. It's been totally out of grace and mercy. You didn't deserve it. You proved that time and time again. But now here's where we have to, go even further because that's great to know that he's the lord your god that he's freed you from slavery he's the one that provides for you but you know we got it better remember what paul says in galatians 4 7 so you are no longer a slave but a son and if a son then an heir through god yeah see we have it so much better because we're not just slaves of God. We don't just do these things because we have to. No, we're the actual children of the Heavenly Father. Uh, and, and so that's the thing. You may take your kids to the grocery store. If they were your slaves, they'd get no candy. <laughs> but they're not your slaves, are they? They're your beloved children. And so, oh, okay, you, you can have some candy. Uh, but God does better than that, doesn't he? He says, oh, no, no. Uh, I've given you things here on this earth, but I've got so much better I'm preparing for you in my house. And you'll have that because you're not a slave anymore. You are my son. And you know that because I sent my son to redeem you. So that's how I would summarize it. Uh, We've got it better than they had here in uh, Leviticus 25. So, Pastor John Lekomsky, co-host of Wrestling with the Basics, giving us God's strong word. Leviticus chapter 25. Pastor Lukomsky, thank you again for the gifts. Thank you, Brady.